Hello, and welcome to Repro Film Festival by Mama Film. I'm Leela Meadow Connor. I'm Mallory Martin. And I'm Debbie Sample. As the founders of Repro, we thank you for joining us for these call to action conversations. We want to thank the village of people who have made this festival possible our filmmakers, special guests, partners, sponsors, and of course, you, our audience. You've let your time, talents, and expertise to help amplify the voices that are so crucial in the fight for reproductive justice and bodily autonomy. When you purchase tickets and donate to Repro, you become an active participant in change as all net ticket sales and accompanying donations support our five beneficiary organizations. We thank you for participating in these vitally important call to action conversations and hope you leave feeling empowered to be your own advocate in the world. Please keep women's reproductive rights at the forefront of your mind as we enter this critical election season. We're pleased to present the When Pregnancy Gets Complicated Call to Action Conversation, moderated by Chloe Malas, CNN Entertainment Reporter. Thank you, Repro Team. My name is Chloe Malas, and I'm joined today by some exceptional individuals who will be speaking with me about when pregnancy gets complicated. As a reminder, this call to action conversation is to cancel the shame and embrace the struggles that often come with pregnancy in the path to get there. I would like to introduce our special guests, Molly Ann Coogan, writer and star of the short film Avalanche, Barbara Calora, president and CEO of Resolve, the National Infertility Association. Thank you guys so much for being here. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, Molly, Avalanche, I was feeling all of the feels. This movie is so the short film is so necessary. Um, you had me crying. Uh, I got to know, first of all, tell me about when you first came up um, with the idea to do this. What made you want to share your own personal struggle so publicly? I mean, you have been a writer for you know so many shows. You've had so much success over the years. But when I was reading your bio, what made you make this pivot to do something just so raw and personal? Yeah, well, you know, I... I tend to write stuff in general that is very female focused and kind of tends to tell those female stories. And it's Avalanche is based on a true story that happened to me. And I found out I was pregnant. Um, I got into a festival in LA with another short two days before I was supposed to leave. I had a miscarriage. I had no idea what to do. I spent a week in LA kind of, <laughs> in a fog and just sort of going through these motions. And um, once I kind of got through it and to the other side, I kind of looked back and realized I A, had felt so alone. B, I was also like, why did I go to this festival? Why did I put myself through that? Why didn't I feel like I could talk about it and get the support that I needed? And I also, the more I talked about it, the more women talked to me about their stories that were similar. And I just felt really compelled, I think, as a way to process what had happened to me. I tend to do that through writing. So there was the maybe selfish element of processing my own stuff, but also really deeply feeling like this is something that needs to be talked about. And that's my medium. That's the way I can talk about it and get that out there. So it felt important to me as, um, as a woman and as somebody who had been through that to use that to amplify the voices of all the other women as well that had had that experience. Tell me about just the timeline. Uh, you know, just as an entertainment reporter, I'd love to know from the thought in your head to when you guys wrapped and this was, you know, able for people like myself and everyone watching to see how, what was that timeline? Sure. So I actually wrote it. It's based on a pilot script that I wrote for a show. So we're actually hoping to take this out to pitch it as a TV series and kind of expand it. Um, but I, I wrote the pilot in 2017 and then kind of sat on it. I ended up getting pregnant. I have a two-year-old. He was born in March of 2018. Um, and then we left New York and moved to LA. And I kind of then was like, you know what? I want to do something with this. And I'd been sitting on it for a little over a year. So I think the idea for the short happened in January of 2019. We shot it 
we really started moving in May. I wrote the script like February, March. We shot it in July of 2019, edited it in August, started submitting it to festivals by September. So it's been a pretty quick, quick turnaround. Yeah. And you know, Barbara, when you watch Avalanche and you see just how um, her character is sitting there in that meeting and it's almost just like people either don't want to talk about infertility, there's such a stigmatization around it. Um, you see the television executives saying, but we want happy stories on television. We don't want to talk about real stories that, that men and women are going through. Can you talk about just the mental health aspect of it? And do you feel like there's been a shift in the past few years? Because I feel like there has been, where I feel like more people are talking about infertility and finding their tribes. But can you talk about maybe the culture shift, but also um, the importance of mental health throughout all of this. Yeah, thanks, Chloe. And Molly, I, um, I really so appreciate you doing the film. Um, I'd love to interview you as well and, and find out more about, um, you know, I, I just like to, to Chloe's point about the emotional part of it. When you watch the film today, now you've probably seen it a hundred times, but you experienced that yourself. Do you, do you still feel it or is it now so like, wait, this is the film, I can look at it critically or is there a part of you that still goes, ooh, I lived through that. I'm just curious because that, that yeah. will help answer my Chloe's question. So I actually can't watch stuff I'm in. It makes me feel like I'm going to barf mm -hmm. um, because all I do is see all the things that are wrong with it. So for me, once it's edited and locked, I actually really can't okay. watch it. So I'm sorry to give you a horrible answer to your question, but I will say, you know, we filmed it a year ago and there were actually points in the filming process while we were shooting that were surprisingly really emotional for me. Like when we shot the thing with the milk coming in, that's actually something that happened to me. I had a second pregnancy after my miscarriage that I had to terminate early in my second trimester due to a medical issue. And nobody told me that my milk might come in. And so two days after that happened and I hadn't thought about, you know, I had prosthetic breasts on for the shoot. It was, did not feel real in a lot of ways, but when we went to film that, I got extremely Wow. emotional um so in the process of filming some of it there were definitely things that came up but i yeah I, everyone else in it was so wonderful but i can't really watch it <laughs> well you know that's that's the thing i mean in infertility and by the way somebody having a miscarriage is not necessarily infertility but when you are trying to build your family it's not working it's um it's it's a very lonely uh, journey. Uh, you feel alone. You feel stigmatized. Who's who's sitting there talking to everybody about what's going on in your bedroom or what's not going on um, in reproduction? And honestly, Chloe, there's so little men and women know about reproduction in the U.S. I mean, our literacy, our reproduction literacy is so poor that you 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 don't even know how to explain this to people. But it is um, it's devastating for many of us going through infertility, not being able um, to have a child becomes our life crisis. And you're right though, what you've started to see over these last few years is the power of people sharing their story. And guess what happens when you share your story? First of all, you start educating people. So that really helps in that literacy. You also create more sympathy and more awareness and more empathy, but you also start feeling better yourself. And you said it, Molly, you started talking to women and like people came out of the woodwork. And Chloe, I know it's happened to you because you've talked about it. It's, it happened to me. It happens to all of us who start to share our story. People come out of the woodwork and say, oh, thank you. I didn't, I didn't have the guts to do it. I couldn't do it. I didn't feel comfortable doing it, but people, people need to know. And, and so we need a lot more of that. And, and that's why things like this film, I mean, Chloe, you've done so much publicly in sharing your story. Um, I just, I just applaud you because both of you, because you've taken something that's so personal that can be so easily shoved aside and forgotten 
in the in the world and you chose to talk about it and you chose to really reveal yourself and that's what we need we need a, we need a lot more of that to get to the point where i don't feel stigmatized where i don't feel alone and i don't feel shame I also just think that everybody's journey is just so incredibly different. Um, I had a friend of mine, she's just got an egg retrieval this morning. Um, and you know, she had her own journey. And then for me, you know, IVF worked on the first try and I almost have had guilt about that when I share my story, because I know that so many people don't have that experience. And same with the second time when I did IVF for my second child, it worked again, but we also have male factor infertility issues with our situation. Um, I've knock on wood, I have not had a miscarriage. So there's things that I, you know, haven't experienced. But then again, when it comes to tons of IUIs and the grief and the despair and the feeling like you're never going to have a child, I, you know, obviously can relate to that and then going through IVF, but everybody's journey is so personal. You know, I have to know, Molly, um, you see again, that scene where your character, which is, you know, loosely based on your own life, sitting in front of that television executive. Um, when you look at how fertility and infertility is portrayed on television and in films, um, why do you think we aren't seeing more storylines that involve these types of real situations that so many people are going through? Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. And to me, anything having to do with on-screen representation, whether it's about women's issues and miscarriage and what we're talking about today, or representation of BIPOC and people of color, it, to me, it starts from the top down. So kind of anything across the board, studios have to have people who are the ones who are literally making the decisions of what shows they're buying and what they're not there has to be diversity at the top so if you only have one group of people who are the ones sitting in those seats they're only going to be choosing things from their perspective and what they think works and what they think doesn't and Traditionally, those seats have been held by men and who are white. And I think there is starting to be some shift, um, but I think that anything with representation and diversity, if you don't have people at the top who are uh, in, in different groups, it's not, how do you expect then the people at the very bottom to keep punching up because you can only get so far. So it's like, I think that it starts at a top level and people that are really making changes within studios. Um, and then I also think, you know, in terms of what we can do, it's, it's continuing to make content and push for it. So, um, you know, I will say there are, uh, diversity programs. A lot of the studios I actually just completed, the one that I completed wasn't a diversity program, but I just did a program with Warner Brothers for writing, but look out for opportunities at studios and networks that have programs that you can apply to. I know the people that are running those programs are advocating for stories like this. So um, Karen Horn, who was director of diversity and inclusion at NBC Universal, she's now just moved over to Warner Media. She's a huge advocate. She ran a writing development program there. She's and um, you know really looking for those opportunities and going for them. Don't just sit at home and think. I'm never going to get in. They're never going to want to read this. Like you have to keep trying. So there's that element that we can do. But I also think that so much of it has to do with diversifying the people that are at the upper echelon studios, executives, and, and having that come down. Well, I think that representation of oneself on screen is so important. I remember when I was watching This Is Us, one of my favorite television shows um, on NBC that I hope comes back in the fall, despite the pandemic. Um, when you see Chrissy Metz's character going through IVF and just all of the challenges and also being someone um, who was overweight going through those challenges, I really applauded them for doing that. But again, not all movies are uh, should be portraying it like what to expect when you're expecting or knocked up both great movies, but that's not uh, everyone's story. So you get, you feel like you're in this tiny little bubble, but little do you realize that so many people are living with this dirty little secret, which is known as um, infertility. I think that also Barb, 
um, you know, so many people out there want to know what can they do, right? So what can they do outside of, you know, buying, watching, asking for more of these of, of this type of content. Um, you know, obviously we have an election around the corner. I know that voting is uh, something that's incredibly important. I know that you all at Resolve had something incredible happen uh, not too long ago with New York finally passing uh, legislation to make surrogacy legal, um, which is huge. So bravo. But what can people do in terms of a call to action? Well, there's a couple of things, you know, when you think about just spreading awareness, it, you don't have to be a filmmaker like Molly to make a big impact. You can start with just your own, your own community, your own family, friends, uh, your circle, whether that's uh, social media, whether that's personal stories, that's an opportunity for you to start educating um, people closest to you. And you know what, they're going to they're going to believe you because they know you and they're going to see um, the struggles that you went through. And, um, and that in and of itself is, is huge. Now my shirt says one in eight. Here's the thing. People don't think that many people get infertility. Chloe, you and I talk about, you know, you know this because so many people are like, Oh, I don't know if I know anyone. Well, it's one in eight couples uh, of reproductive age have, have issues you do know someone. The problem is they're not talking about it. And so therefore all of us um, don't have the same kind of, kind of awareness. Look, I know how hard it is to share and to talk about it. This is hugely personal. So it's not gonna be for everyone, but that's certainly one way that people can make a difference is by speaking up and sharing their story. Now, let's say you're a little pissed off that your insurance isn't covering this uh, you know, you're in a state like used to be in New York where something like surrogacy was illegal and you're realizing what is going on? Why isn't the system uh, supportive of what I'm going through as a woman and especially something like the ability to have a family? And oh, by the way, I work for a great company and I have great benefits, but now I find out that this particular thing is excluded along with like two other things that, and they call it elective. So we get enough of people who speak up and, and, and are angry about that, Chloe. That's how we do our advocacy. We do it at the federal level. We do it at the state level. And it's all about access. It's about breaking down the barriers so that everybody has an opportunity at family. You know, you're talking about, Molly, you're talking about the diversity in the studio and in the executives one of the things that is happening in our space or happens in our space is that who is getting care is not a reflection of who gets infertility. So the people who get care are generally middle to upper class, generally white, and have the, um, the income or the disposable income, if you will, to pay out of pocket for something that they didn't plan for, that they haven't been saving for, and, oh, and like, let's get started and fork over, you know, 15 to 25 to 30 to $40,000. So oftentimes we hear this, gosh, infertility. And I hear this from legislators, by the way. Why should I help infertility people? You know, it's just a bunch of white women who, you know, make a lot of money and waited too long. Wow, that is so not who suffers from infertility. And so we need to break those barriers so that the access is available to all. And that's really our goal at Resolve and what we're trying to do. Exactly. I mean, Molly, I don't know about you, but, um, and, I, and I don't know if you have been through um, any fertility treatments. No, so I didn't act. I don't actually have. I haven't had infertility issues. I just had a right. miscarriage, and then so that has. I've had people close to me experience it, but I personally have not. I can say that just you know the healthcare aspect of it, and I know people who have had to do IVF and um, all sorts of things, and put a second mortgage on their home, and um, it's it's debilitating. I know people that have had to go. Um, overseas. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's so 
so tough. But I, I do want to ask you, Molly, um, there's a scene in, in Avalanche where you call your mom. And when I did IVF the first time, I didn't tell my family that I was doing it because I didn't want to let everybody down. Can you talk to me about, was that something that happened in your own life? And, and why'd you put that scene in there? Um, so that that I that specifically didn't happen, but there was a lot of emotion and feeling around it that informed me putting that in the script. And really similar to your point, uh, you know, as we've all talked about, like making the decision to start a family can also be a very private one. So that's also what's so complicated about it is you need the support from people, but like we didn't tell anybody that we were starting to try. Um, and we didn't want to at that yeah. beginning stage. And so in some ways it's, it's complicated because you want to keep things private, but you also need access to the information, right? So it's, that's why I do think it's so important for information to be accessible so that if you want to stay private about it and you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to, but you can get the support that you need. But back to your question, you know, it, it was, you know, I still remember, having to call my mom to tell her I had had a miscarriage. And I'm extremely close to my mother. I'm so lucky that my mom is um, somebody that I really can talk to about anything. And I still had that like, ugh, like pit in my stomach and it was devastating. Um, and I think that that's just to me represents how complicated this whole experience is that even if you have somebody that's supportive and somebody um, that you know will be there for you, there can still be that own devastation of having to share it. Even like what you said, you didn't want to disappoint them. So it's even that kind of incredibly complicated series of emotions that you experience of you've just gone through something totally difficult, but you're worried about other people's feelings around what you've gone through. Um, let me and, ask, yeah. Let me, well, I was just thinking, let me ask you both this. Did you feel that sharing your story, was there ever a time that you look back and you were like, kind of wish I hadn't done this? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Cause in, and to me that's connected to, uh, the responses that I received that were really hurtful. Um, mm -hmm. where I don't necessarily think people were trying to be hurtful at all, but I think there's a, again, going back to this idea of information, um, and you know, Barb, what you said earlier also for people that don't want to speak out of starting small, I think one of the other ways that people, if they've never experienced miscarriage or infertility, you can also get information around how can I support somebody that's maybe going through it. That's a way that you can even become informed, right? Because, I had so many experiences after my miscarriage and after the abortion I had to have uh, where people I think were well-intentioned, but it was extremely painful and hurtful. And I ended up writing an article about that as well um, because that's a piece of the puzzle that I think people, I think people really want to know what to do, but they don't. Yep. And they don't know where to find information. And then that burden usually gets placed on the person that's going through the challenging experience. And there were times where I like sat through conversation where there was like a monologue going in the back of my head being like, get out of this. Why are you here? Like, <laughs> this is awful. But I stuck it out mm -hmm. and I didn't have the energy and the wherewithal, the time and the emotional strength to say, this is actually hurtful and hard and, and I'm not, and I'm going to go. Um, so I do think that actually that's another way that people can become advocates and become informed is how do I support people that are going through it? That's also why my husband has started talking about male factor infertility, because to talk about your sperm is not something that, uh, many men want to talk about, or I, I feel like when I went into this process, I was blind. I knew nothing. And I never thought that I would get to IVF. I thought IVF was a death sentence. I thought it was the end of the road and it ended up being my golden ticket. So I love IVF and I'm so grateful to have smart human beings in the world that are brilliant, who have created IVF to allow me to have the family that I always wanted, although it doesn't work for everyone. Um, 
you know, when we were going through our process, I just, I'm such a sharer. I'm the kind of person on an airplane, I'll tell you everything about myself to a total stranger, but there was something about having to take everybody along for the ride that made me so stressed out. And I wanted to experience this myself because I, if I was going to fail at this, I wanted to fail with just my husband and I, I always knew I wanted to share my story and I didn't know how. And to this day, I still talk about it. And I just figure, I guess if I just give one person some hope, a piece of information, a question that they should ask their doctor, um, you know, when you were going through everything that you went through, Molly, um, with having to, um, you know, have two different pregnancies with their own complications. Um, how did you find the bedside manner of your doctors? And did you have the same doctor throughout? Because I'm a big advocate for speaking out and switching doctors, switching clinics. Cause I know a lot of people don't barb and I don't, I want to get your opinion on that, but Molly, what was your experience with your doctors and how they handled it? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, I had a real, range and the gynecologist that I had been at, um, you know, was the first miscarriage that I had. It was a, it was a, um, combined practice of OBGYNs and midwives. And I had a wonderful midwife and then one who was not so wonderful. And then also two, um, gynecologists who happened to be male, uh, where I had some really challenging experiences I had after, uh, the miscarriage that I had, I had to go in, you know, they check to make sure that everything has been flushed out of your system. They do a sonogram to make sure there isn't any tissue still left. And I was back in the sonogram room where I had had the sonogram where they told me there was no heartbeat and they left me in there for an hour and a half waiting for the doctor to come in. And I was by myself and I remember sitting there you know, with my like pant, you know, like you're like, you have like the paper over you and I'm just laying there. And I remember thinking like, I, I don't think I can be in this room anymore, but I kept waiting and kept waiting. And finally, I don't know what came over me, but I like wrapped the paper around my waist and opened the door and just walked into the hallway. And I was like, you have to get someone in here right now. And Finally, he came in about 10 minutes later, he did the sonogram and then just and was like, circle of life and walked out. Literally said that to me and walked out of the room. And I was just sitting there having this moment of being like, is this a joke? This is crazy, but also sobbing. Um, and I got pregnant again, I, and then was at that practice and partway through my pregnancy, I just remember thinking like, why am I here? Why am I, this doesn't feel good. Um, and at around 21 weeks, like pretty far into my pregnancy, past the point that a lot of people say that you're like allowed to switch providers. I was like, I'm out, I'm not doing this anymore. And I switched to a practice full of midwives that, and had the most unbelievable care and treatment. Um, and, you know, to me, again, that's an education piece, right? Not just for women, but providers. So one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle, I think, is access to education and information and compassionate and informed providers. And to me, again, we're talking about top down, who is in positions of legislation, who, um, you know, again, voting for people that will advocate. And, you know, I also think like, I am a white woman, I did have financial resources, I was able to advocate for myself and to realize like, I could switch providers, even though I was being told I couldn't or that that was a bad idea. Um, I had, I had choices. And you look even just a couple of months ago, like, uh, in South LA, Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital was, they were doing budget cuts and they were going to shut that hospital down. And that hospital pr predominantly serves black and brown women in South LA. Um, and, you know, black women are three times as likely to die from maternal and maternity complications, according, that was from a report from the CDC in 2019. Um, so, you know, I, I think what I'm trying to say is, having access to the in 
to compassionate care providers is critical for your emotional health, for your mental health, for your physical health when you're going through pregnancy. And having care providers accessible to everyone is so important. I feel like I'm getting a little rambly at this point, but no, I understand what you're saying. And Barb, I, uh, Barbara, but I, I I know everybody does call you Barb. Uh, I, I want to know, um, you know, when I have been to, uh, the night of hope and your gala that you have done in, in New York city, um, and my CNN colleague, Allison Camerata brought me, and there's so many doctors. And I actually saw my IVF nurse, who was the woman who was there for me with, with Leo throughout the whole process there. And um, it was such a great night. But when you are interfacing with these doctors and these providers, um, do you guys give feedback of the things that you all hear from men and women who have gone through IVF? Or is there a way to educate them also about the things to say and not to say also, because it's a very touchy situation. And that's one of the main reasons why I switched from this huge fertility clinic in New York City and went to this other clinic. And this new doctor, Dr. Reichman at Cornell, said to me within just a week, you need to do IVF and shot me straight and put me right on track to where I needed to be. But he also was very sensitive, but we also spoke up to him at one point in the process where my husband, and remember we had just come off of IUIs in a very rough year, he said, you've got to be more accessible emotionally to us because mm -hmm. this isn't working. And he switched because I know doctors have to keep a little bit of space. They can't, you know, become best friends with all of their patients. Um, but what do you guys do at Resolve? is the long end question. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, this, like, like most uh, of medicine, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna connect with some physicians and you're not gonna connect with some physicians. And it could be um, the way the practice is set up. It could be the way um, they, they run the, the assigned nurses and assigned physicians. And there isn't, no, there isn't one way a fertility clinic is run. And also some of them are at academic institutions, some of them are standalone. If you are not feeling like you're getting the care or the answers that you need, you need to go have a consult somewhere else and, and you need to switch. Um, I mean, that's just absolutely positively, um, you, you, it's too important for you to be in a situation where you're not feeling like you're getting the care that you need. So in answer to your question, it's funny you ask that because here we are in 2020 in, um, with a COVID-19 world and we did a patient survey just recently. We did it in April and May and we asked um, women who were right now in process of doing IVF who may have had to put it on hold because of COVID-19. Um, we asked them a lot of questions about their emotional health, we asked them if they were getting the right resources, how, how they were communicating with their clinic, what kind of communication they were getting. And our whole point, Chloe, of doing that was to share it with the providers and to say, okay, this is what patients are experiencing right now and what they need and what's not happening. And we, we put the whole survey out there. Um, we've done, you know, we pushed it out and marketed it um, with the hopes that exactly to your point that, that Physicians will read this. I mean, like, for example, can you imagine here it is COVID-19, everybody is just beside themselves. While you're one of those people that maybe you were supposed to have an egg retrieval, start your IVF cycle, maybe you have your meds and you already even started taking them. And now the clinic is shut down indefinitely and there's no telling when it's, when it's gonna open. And all the information you're getting from your clinic is posted on Facebook. So you have no one-on-one -on -one communication. And I'm not saying this happened to everybody, but we heard it from a lot of people. They were trying to reach their doctors. They never had a, a actual personal phone call. I learned on Facebook that this was gonna happen. So the other thing is we asked in our survey, do you feel that you were supported from a mental health perspective? Did you receive resources um, that would help you in this time with your mental health? And the majority of respondents said no. And, and so I was so, gosh, when I read the results of that, I was, I was kind of flipped out because I was like, oh, people are struggling. People are, are really in a bad place. And they're going to look to their provider to say, help me. And if their provider is not even giving them, here's all these mental health resources, here's what we can do for you, then they're, then they're really feeling alone. And so 
I, um, I hope that a lot of physicians read it. I heard from some who said it was really helpful. I heard from others who said, I know we did a great job. And I think the people who filled out that survey weren't, were talking about my competitor across the street. So you, <laughs> you know, you have to be, um, you have to be of the mindset that you want to, you want to take a look at what you're doing. Now, you and your husband, Chloe, you told your physician what you needed. And one of the things that we tell patients all the time is to set those expectations. Be, be your own best advocate. And when you're sitting down with these physicians or the nurse, tell them what you need and, and tell them what is going to make this journey better for you. And, and just don't just be passive and sit back, be upfront. That's hard to do, I know, but yeah, I mean, we're going to be doing another survey, uh, Chloe, on um, what patients are, are needing right now and what their fears are. And that the results of that, are, again, are going to be aimed at providers. I want to talk, I want to circle back to the mental health aspect of it. Um, Molly, when you were going through um, your miscarriage and you were at the, out in LA, uh, did you say it was a film festival or you were mm -hmm. out there? Okay. Yes. You're out in LA. Like pitching some stuff. Yeah. How are you, how did you deal with the mental health aspect of it? Because you said in your other situation um, where you ended up having to uh, have a DNC, right? Um, I had a, I had a DNE for, I had to terminate a pregnancy. Okay. So when you did that, I mean, and your milk is coming in and you're getting those pregnancy hormones, how did you deal with the mental health aspect of it? Not well. <laughs> um, I, you know, for the, with the miscarriage, I will say I was very fortunate in the sense that my mom, my aunt, my sister, and my best friend were already planning to come for the festival. So I had this like immediate cocoon of people, which was wonderful in a lot of ways. And also sometimes was really hard. Like there were times where I just wanted to be by myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and after I had to terminate that pregnancy, that was one of the most devastating experiences of my life. Um, and I've dealt with a lot of loss in my life, um, but that was unique in a way that I'd never experienced before. And you say that in the movie, you say that line in the movie. I said, "What I I do, I do. I, do. I, I, I do. Yes, a line in the short film." Where yeah, you say that you've experienced a lot of loss, but this is different, and the hotel uh, worker is comforting you. Yeah. So this is um, a reveal that I'm not very imaginative, and I uh, <laughs> just write a lot of real things, and I'm not very good at what I do. Um, That's but you're amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> it's like the best. It's so good. Everybody needs to see Avalanche. It's amazing. So but I think that that's that that's the point, right? Is that it isn't like other forms of grief. And so there has to be attention paid to how specific and different that is. And I just remember, you know, we, uh, I was really depressed and I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know also about that hormonal cascade, like you were talking about, about the postpartum hormones that come in. So when my milk came in, I experienced this huge wave of, and my milk came in and I couldn't nurse. So I had to immediately try and um, dry it up. It was excruciatingly painful. I didn't want to be in public. I didn't want anyone to see me. My breasts were, were I, I'm normally very small chested. Um, and I, I didn't, I did, literally didn't want to leave my house. Um, and nobody also then told me about the hormonal impact of then what can happen when you, when you don't nurse. So like, even when I weaned with my son, after I was fortunate that breastfeeding was successful for me and that was the choice I had made. Um, and I, when we weaned, I had a whole wave of hormones and depression that came up after I stopped nursing and I had no idea that would happen. And that was after an uncomplicated pregnancy and uncomplicated delivery. Um, and so after the termination, I, again, providers, I, even though I was with a really wonderful practice, um, or no, at the time I wasn't at a, a great practice, they did not inform me that that might happen. 
Um, so a lot of it, I was kind of just suffering on my own and I didn't know if it was just grief or what. I was fortunate enough then um, to find a therapist who was really wonderful and talk therapy was really helpful for me. Um, and, but I did feel like I muddled through a lot of it by myself and was kind of just like grasping at straws. Um, you yeah. Know, I don't know if they offered this at clinics, uh, Barbara fertility clinics, but for those listening, something that was very helpful at Cornell for me was I had come, uh, jumped into IVF immediately after several rounds of IUI. So there was no downtime. And I, it was such a, you know, pedal to the floor, floorboard uh, year. Everybody around me was getting pregnant. I thought I was going to just burst into flames if I didn't have a child. I couldn't handle seeing any human being pregnant. I wanted to just die every time I was at Starbucks or saw anybody pregnant. I was so bitter. I was so resentful. I was such a terrible version of myself. Um, it hurt friendships. I mean, it was a bad year. I couldn't go to baby showers. And I remember just going through the, um, the, the drugs for IVF and thinking, I don't feel well. I feel mentally unwell. Not saying I'm going to hurt myself, but I could understand how somebody could. And I just didn't feel good. And I was fighting with my husband so much. It was really bad. And you would think that you are in this place where I'm sorry if I'm oversharing. I know I'm the moderator, but here I am talking so much, but, um, I'm, sitting there and my husband and I are fighting. You think that you're going to be in this situation where finally you have an answer. Finally, you're doing IVF. Again, I felt like it was the end of the road and it wasn't going to work. Nothing had worked before. So why would this work? And my doctor recommended me seeing a psychiatrist at the hospital who only deals with patients going through infertility. Everybody should have that. It was so nice to sit down with somebody who could sit there and tell my husband and just say out loud that I'm not crazy. Right. Everything I'm feeling is normal. Right. And she equated going through fertility treatments, her words, not mine, to going through cancer treatment. Well, that, that's now, what the data, the data shows that. She wasn't just saying that. The data shows that, Chloe. Well, thank you, because that makes me feel better. So, can, yeah, I mean, do you know yeah. more? Well, this is, you know, um, you were at a practice that had it, what they call embedded mental health um, psychologists and mental health support, and a lot of practices across the country do, or they have relationships with um, mental health providers outside of the practice um, that see, see patients. I saw somebody for a year, and her entire, I saw her every week, because I was like, I need to come here every week. Her entire practice are men and women with infertility. And, and so there, there are, it's a, it's a part of the mental health field is people who are experts in, in helping people with uh, pregnancy loss, um, with miscarriages, with infertility, um, and, and thinking through all that. In fact, Chloe, if we were talking about New York and the surrogacy law, if you're gonna do um, if you're going to choose to build your family through a gestational surrogate, you have to have mental health counseling. And you don't just go to anybody. You go to somebody who knows this field and knows it well. And look, if, if seeing a, a, a mental health professional is not up your sleeve, it's just not something you're comfortable doing, get peer support. Resolve has peer groups all over the country. Now, during COVID, they're meeting virtually and we're doing um, virtual support groups. But just like you said, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. I'm not going, I mean, I had to have my husband and my closest friend and I had a business with her at the time. And separately, they both sat me down and they said, you are not well. You, you, are, you are not well and you've got to get help because you can't get through one thing of anything without crying or this, like this is so not you. And, and I, um, I appreciated that. And I was in that woman's office once a week for a year. And it is nothing to be ashamed of, but that's the emotional toll that this puts on you. And you need, I just listening to Molly, how many times Molly did you say, no one told me, no mm -hmm. one told me. Now we could sit here and talk for hours about how the, the healthcare system didn't tell us this or providers. And, and this is where I say, 
you know what, we got to be our own advocate. And um, you're not alone. And especially with infertility, this is why Resolve actually exists. It's because of this community and connecting people and the emotional side of this. Because We don't do medical research at Resolve. We are about the patient. We're about taking care of you. And um, because, boy, this is nothing to sneeze at. This is, you should take it seriously and get the help and support peer, professional, online, in person. And guess what? You can get telehealth now, um, so you can be anywhere. And I think as women, we're usually conditioned to suck it up, not complain. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it's like if you get diagnosed with cancer, you're not going to go to the dentist to get them to fix it. So you go to the person who's specialized to help you with what you need the help with. And so I think your point about mental health professionals who are specialized in dealing with that is so important. And you know, I think about when I switched to the midwifery practice, um, I, when I was pregnant with my son, I remember sitting down in the office and one of the first things she did after looking at my chart is she was like, so you're, you're, you're pregnant after loss. And it was the first person, the first provider who acknowledged that, yes, I was pregnant, which was so wonderful, but what I was carrying with me into that pregnancy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. so having, having that was huge for me. Um, and I think, and, and even with infertility too, and when you were talking about the treatments that you were going through, hormones are very real. And a lot of times we don't know what they do to our bodies, whether it's during infertility and, or during your period. So even just having somebody be able to explain to you, like, yeah, you might feel like you're losing your mind because medically this is literally what's happening. Um, right. It's right. so important. Right. And, you know, we're having to, like you said, suck it up, go to work. I had just started a new job. I was lucky that my boss said to me on the first day, like an angel sent from heaven because I had just come from a job that was emotionally taxing on me for several years. And the first thing she says to me, it was crazy. She goes, you know, I'm here. If you ever want to start a family or you're ever thinking about starting a family, which you would think would be maybe inappropriate, but it wasn't, it was exactly what I needed to hear. She's like, I'm here to support you in any way. And then that just opened up for me to be able to tell her shortly thereafter that I was trying. Turns out she had done several rounds of IVF that never worked. Then she ended up randomly getting naturally two different times. And now she has two little boys after traveling the country, meeting with doctors and being told she would never have children. Then I remember sitting at work and I heard some male coworkers of mine talking about IVF and my coworker, Brian Stelter, who's the host of Reliable Sources on CNN, talking about uh, how he and his wife, Jamie, were going through IVF. And I remember thinking, wait, he's talking about it out loud and like it's no big deal so i shared with them and my own family didn't know what i was going through <laughs> here all of a sudden i was building this tribe of men because a few other guys on the team their wives were going through ivf and we were all going through this together so this misconception that you have to have a tribe of women not true and that people just don't talk about it and i'm not saying that you should go and tell your coworkers or your boss what you're going through but then again sometimes you don't know unless you say something. And I know it's scary, so I'm not saying you should share it with a stranger or share it with somebody at your office. But for me, it worked out great because here I was coming to the office and everybody knew what I was going through in this small group of people, not everybody, everybody. And it just felt, felt a sense of relief. And then the second time when we did IVF, I brought everybody along for the ride. I regretted bringing everybody along for the ride because I felt like I was gonna let people down. Um, I think that we've touched on so many important points. We've talked about infertility during a pandemic. We've talked about uh, miscarriages and um, so many things that we have all experienced. And obviously finding your tribe, speaking out, advocating for yourself, especially going to places like Resolve. Um, do you guys feel like we have yeah. missed missed anything that we that we oh, should I mean, be mentioning? I think the last thing I will just say, which you just brought up, is that it's not just a women's issue and that having that open dialogue. And again, from the top down, your boss said that to you, which opened a whole door. Um, so, and recognizing that 
it's something that we experience as women, but we often do it with a partner and having support for both people that are going through it is critical and destigmatizing it also for men, I think is really important as well. So I'm really glad that you, you brought that up. And with all the doctor's appointments and having to miss work and egg retrievals and all of these things, it's great when you have people in positions of power that are understanding and not just providing it as part of a healthcare plan, but also like really walking the walk and really like fostering an environment where someone feels like, okay, I can go and freeze my eggs or I can go and use this money towards surrogacy or adoption, but that's going to take time out of the office. I can't just go do infertility uh, between this hour of the day or on the weekend. So I think that, yes, there still is such a stigmatization, but I hope that conversations like these can help empower other people. Um, and Molly, where can everybody see Avalanche along with seeing it at this wonderful film festival? Can they follow you on social anywhere? Yes, yeah, so you can follow, there's Avalanche the Film on Instagram, my handle, Molly and Coogan um, at Instagram. And we're actually, we have a, I'm not allowed to publicly announce yet, but there's another couple festivals coming up that we're really excited about and then hopefully um, we'll be doing a release and maybe a television show out of it and uh, vote, 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 2020, vote. That's Bar, all. Can you tell everybody where they can find you and how they can get involved with their local Resolve chapter? Yeah, so um, you can go to resolve.org, resolve.org, and you can find support groups. You can find out what's going on in your state from a legislative perspective. You can um, find a mental health provider. So there's a lot of tremendous resources there. And most of all, you find community and you find a, a group of people um, who get you, who understand you, and who are with you on your journey, wherever that may lead. I've gotten to know the Resolve chapter in New England and I love them. Um, but yes, there are chapters all over the country. Um, so for those of you watching, you guys should definitely take advantage of it. Well, thank you guys for your time. Thank this you. really good. Thank you. This was wonderful. I enjoyed it. Molly, and good luck. Remember, Mo Molly, when you need a reporter to guest star on your television show. You're my here, woman, Chloe. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.